to the online family program here at the Sunshine Coast Health Centre. This is week two of a four-part series about how codependency is better understood from an addiction theory framework. Last week, I gave a couple definitions about codependency and also a definition of attachment theory. And this week, I'm going to do a brief overview of the history of codependency. So codependency... Uh, the concept of codependency really gained its popularity around 1980. And at this time, um, codependents were called uh, co-alcoholics or chief enablers. And again, putting them into that either victim role or unwitting perpetrator role. So I wanted to mention about that. There's quite a bit of research um, in psychology today that tells us that the, the label that we put on people has a direct effect on how they feel and, and their be resulting behaviors. So for example, if I were to label somebody as a victim and they were to really take on that label, um, they would feel powerless. And as a result, they probably wouldn't do anything to help themselves. And in effect, their label would become a self-fulfilling prophecy. So we really need to be careful about the labels that we give people. So the construct of codependency was partially developed in the recognition that people who were partnered with alcoholics or addicts needed help too. And uh, the way to get help in the United States at least um, is to have a diagnosis in the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. So a lot of work went into trying to include the concept of codependency in the DSM. And uh, psychologists um, spent a lot of effort trying to validate this concept, to come up with a, a definition that everybody could agree on, but they just, um, they just couldn't. It just it, it fell through. Um, even proponents of codependency today will tell you that there is no agreed-upon definition. And in fact, uh, when they do their lectures or their webinars, they just provide their own definition at that time. So um, another criticism of the concept of codependency that came up um, around the 1990s was um, from the feminist perspective, and that is that it was placing blame where none was due, uh, usually on women. Um, so, uh, you know, from from that framework, from the codependency framework, being codependent is seen as unhealthy. However, being codependent is just being human. So this is where attachment theory comes in. <clears throat> attachment theory can explain codependent behavior as a normal reaction to an abnormal situation. So take, for example, um, let's think about a wife and her husband. So the husband is struggling with, it, with alcoholism, and the wife is struggling with his alcoholism too. Uh, you know, he's out late and she's worried about him. She calls his cell phone 15 times. Um, she starts giving ultimatums, saying, I'm going to break up with you if you don't stop doing this. And then she doesn't follow through with that because, of course, she loves him and she doesn't want to lose him. So she's, you know, she's desperate. She's going out of her mind. And so she goes to a support meeting. Um, let's say she goes to an Al-Anon meeting. And somebody there tells her that she's contributing to her husband's disease of uh, alcoholism by being an enabler. So now she's feeling guilty and shameful, and um, you know this is awful. So let's see what we can see from an attachment framework. So let's let's put an attachment lens on that example. If we do that, we can understand the wife's um, attempts as more trying to maintain the relationship with her husband. Addiction puts a huge strain on an attachment relationship, uh, be it husband and wife or uh, son and mother. It doesn't matter. Any kind of relationship puts a huge strain on it. So we can understand her anxiety is not abnormal. It's normal anxiety. Um, maybe the ways that she's going about trying to maintain that relationship are ineffective. In fact, I think they probably are ineffective. But that's more just trying to figure out how to have effective ways of maintaining an attachment relationship. So Dr. Sue Johnson, who is the, um, she developed emotion-focused couples therapy. She talks about this, about uh, effective dependency versus ineffective dependency. So she recognizes that 
Humans are wired for connection. Um, we depend on it for our survival. And sometimes when we reach out for support, we do it in ways that uh, create the opposite of what we're looking for. Um, so, you know, another example I can give is if you think about somebody who is um, anxious in their relationship, they think the other person maybe isn't as committed as they are. So they're constantly looking for assurance for their commitment. But instead of getting that assurance that they're looking for, they're probably annoying the other person. And so instead they're getting uh, anger and distance. This is more a matter of communication than codependency. So next week I'm going to talk about attachment theory. So please join me then.